Okay, here we go. Welcome to Old Dogs and New Tricks. Uh, this is a talk about what's new with Pearl 5 this century. Um, so, a, a initial disclaimer. I'm going to talk pretty fast. I have quite a few slides to get through. So, feel free to ask questions, particularly if I'm moving too quickly. Uh, hi, my name is John. Uh, in my day job, I am the Vice President of Technology for a company called Infinity Interactive. We're a custom software development and technology consultancy. Uh, I used to be a biologist, and then I kind of fell into Linux. Um, I still identify as a member of the Perl tribe. It was kind of my first programming language and my first uh, real open source community. But I'm also kind of a polyglot coder. I like to mess around with programming languages, and I'm just kind of this guy. On the internet, my name is Gene Hack. Uh, so if you tweet about this talk, please tag me so that I see all the bad stuff you're uh, <laughs> saying about me. So how many Perl programmers do we have? Uh, most of the room. Um, so quick survey, how many people are still using 5.6? 5.8? 5.10? 1.0? 1.1? 1.2? 1.3? 1.4? 1.5? 1.6? 1.7? 1.8? 1.9? 1.10? 1.11? 1.12? 1.13? 1.14? 1.15? 1.16
whatever sort of rebirth that Pearl has gone through is this book called Modern Pearl, uh, written by a man named Chromatic. It's available for free online at modernpearlbooks.com. And if you're doing any kind of Pearl, um, you should read this book if you haven't. Um, it's really important to understanding sort of the, the modern grown-up way of doing Pearl. I will put these slides online and tweet out the link to them uh, a little bit later today. So if you need URLs, you can get them from the source. Um, one of the main benefits of having this regular release cycle have been a number of language improvements. I'm only going to talk about a few of them today, kind of my favorite ones. There are a group of files that ship with Perl called the Perl Deltas that describe exactly what has changed in each release. So you can go and read those, uh, particularly if you have trouble getting to sleep. Um, so in 2001, back when we had Perl 5.6, Unicode existed, but it wasn't exactly uh, widely used or very well supported. And today, of course, it's a Unicode world. You kind of have to deal with Unicode if you're doing programming at all. Um, it's kind of too complicated to go into here, but I am going to say that you can, Perl has really great uh, Unicode support. You can be very expressive in your Perl code. That's unfortunate. That's supposed to have a happy face, and then that's, <laughs> that's supposed to have a poo. Um, I don't know why that's not showing up. That's really annoying. It's here on my screen. Um, so you can be very expressive in your code, but not in your slides. Um, <laughs> So a little bit of quick background for the non uh, Perl programmers in the audience. I need to explain how Perl handles true and false. So in, in Perl, there are four values that are false. Uh, zero, the empty string, the empty list, and a special value called undef. Uh, undef is the value that a variable has after it is declared, but before it has been initialized with any value. Um, so undef. Is, is the only thing that is undefined in the language, right? These four values are also false, but zero is defined, the empty string is defined, the empty list is defined. Um, the Boolean operators in Perl, the or, or and and, they look at truthiness. They don't look at definedness by default. They look at truthiness. Um, but many times, the only invalid value for something is undef. For example, if you're trying to decide, you know, if you have a, an input on a web form, zero may be a valid value for that input, right? So a lot of times you're trying to decide not whether or not something is true or false, but whether it is defined or undefined. And it's pretty clumsy. So you end up writing code that looks like this. Defined is a built-in Perl operator that returns true or false based on whether the thing you give it is defined. So if you're trying to set up a default value for something, you would say, is the thing I have defined? OK, use that value. Otherwise, use the default value. This is annoying, right? You write this code a lot. You end up writing it more like this. This is something called the ternary operator, which does the exact same thing as the code on the previous screen. If this is defined, return this. Otherwise, return that. In 5.10, we got a new operator called defined or. Um, so this code now does the exact same thing as that code. So if this is defined, it sets value to this. Otherwise, it sets value to that. This is my favorite feature of the 2000s <laughs> uh, in Perl, um, because this is so incredibly useful. You can also combine it with the assignment operator. So this is how you would say uh, this or set it equal to the default value. You can say, if this is not defined, set it to the default value with slash loss equal. So this is awesome. Um, regular expressions are a big part of Perl programming. Um, you may have heard including uh, substitution style regular expression. So this regular expression here is taking every instance or taking the instance of swap and changing it into stuff in this variable. And this is kind of the naive way to write uh, a substitution regular expression while preserving the original thing. So you make a copy of it and then you apply the substitution on the copy. You can also write that like this. You have to have these parentheses here because that forces this assignment to happen first, and then the regular expression is applied to the result of that assignment, which happens to be dollar $copy. So this is a, a terser way to write this, uh, arguably less clear, uh, but still kind of annoying. Um, new in 514, we got a new thing in the regular expression engine. If you put an R at the end here where you put modifiers, um, this now does the same thing. 
it will make take the substitution, apply it to the value of this variable, and then return the value of the changed variable, leaving this intact. And so then you can capture that in an assignment. So that's pretty cool. Um, we also got a new operator, the double diamond operator. So you may be familiar with the diamond operator. Uh, this is used in processing files that are passed as arguments on the command line. So you use it in a while construct like this. You say while, double diamond, and this will loop over all of the files on the command line and take each line from each file, <coughs> and you can do something with it inside this loop. So you would call this like script.pl, file one, file two, file three, and it would go over each line of each file. Now there's a problem with this, and that the diamond operator uses what's called two argument open semantics. Why is that bad? Well, this is two argument open. This is what we had originally in Perl. You say open, you give it a file handle, and then you give it a file name, and you include a special character at the beginning of that file name string that tells the program whether you're opening the file for reading or writing. This is opening the file for reading because the arrow is pointing to the left, obviously. <laughs> um, this is how you open it for writing. It's pointing into the file, not out of the file. And if you write code like this where you're making a file handle called in and using it for writing, we can't be friends. <laughs> um, <laughs> Two argument open is bad because if your file name is a variable and that variable somehow gets one of these special characters at the beginning of it, bad stuff happens. Um, it's a really good way to overwrite files unintentionally. Um, and if that variable is set by, I don't know, somebody putting something into a web page, now you have a security vulnerability. Um, so this was replaced with something called three argument open where the character controlling what you're doing is split out into a separate argument. So now if you somehow get one of these special characters in the file name part, it just throws an error. It doesn't you know, overwrite some important file. But remember the problem, this diamond operator, which is insanely convenient if you're writing stuff to parse things uh, on the, in files, it uses these two argument open semantics. So if you have a script that uses the diamond operator and you accidentally misquote something like that, you just overwrote file one because Perl just opened it and truncated it to write to it. So that's kind of a bad time. Um, oops. The double diamond operator fixes this. It uses three argument open semantics by default. Uh, this was introduced in 5.22. So if you write files with the diamond operator, you should switch to this. Uh, and then finally, I think this is the biggest change of the 2010s in Perl. We got subroutine signatures. Like we caught up to Fortran in the 70s with this. Um, so this is how you might write a simple Perl function to add two numbers together. And this first line here, uh, Perl has a special variable at underscore which is used to pass arguments into functions. Mm -hmm. So this first line here, it, this is called unpacking at underscore. And pretty much every Perl function you've ever written that takes arguments starts out with a line that looks something like that. With subroutine signatures, you can write it like this put the variables right there in parentheses after the function name, and then under the covers, Perl actually automatically generates this line for you. Um, this is awesome. <laughs> um, is anybody using subroutine signatures? They're still experimental, uh, so you have to put some stuff at the top of your program to turn them on and give you access to them. Um, but this is pretty exciting. You can also do, because it's Perl and it wouldn't be sufficient to just have something simple, you can do all kinds of crazy shit in here too. Like you can have default value assignments. You can run code inside here. Um, it, it gets really hairy, but it's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> we also have some new tools. Uh, so it's not just language level features. We have a host of new tools that make it easier to work with Perl. Um, so these days, like many programming languages, we make a distinction between the Perl that comes with your operating system and the Perl you use for development. So system Perl, uh, just say no. Don't use it. Um, leave it alone. It belongs to your operating system. Your operating system might not want you to change it. It might be an old version. They might be depending on the specific behavior of that old version. So user bin Perl, forget about it. Don't use it anymore. There is a tool. Uh, the first tool that was developed to make it possible to do this is called Perl Brew. This is the website for Perl Brew. Uh, it is at perlbrew.pl. Um, you should go there and hover your mouse over the ninja. Um, there's a second tool that's been developed more recently that does a similar thing. It's called PLENV. 
It does not have a sexy website. It has a GitHub. Um, that's the address for the GitHub. The advantages of both of these tools, uh, using one of these, it solves your vendor lock-in uh, issue where you can't change your Perl interpreter. A lot of people are stuck in an older version of Perl because they are using user bin Perl, and you can't change that, right? That's gonna screw up your operating system. Um, it allows you to install multiple Perl versions at the same time. You can install them in your home directory uh, or any place you have permission to write to, so you don't need to get your sysadmin's permission to change stuff, which can be awesome if your sysadmin is a jerk. Um, it allows you to trivially switch from one version to another, which if you're writing uh, software that might run against different versions of Perl, that's extremely useful. It lets you install modules without having to deal with your jerky sysadmin, which is also cool. And it lets you stay up to date with Perl improvements. So when a, a new version of Perl comes out, a new development version comes out every month, uh, usually around the 20th. And it's trivial to build it and install it and test your, your software with it because of this. PLENV has some advantages over Perlbrew, in my opinion. Um, I actually use PLENV now. Uh, the way it works, Perlbrew does a lot of funky stuff with your path. Uh, PLENV doesn't, which is nice. And PLENV lets you uh, pin or select a particular version of Perl in three different ways. You can set it globally. Um, you can set one for the like your current shell instance that will go away when you close that shell or you can set it on a per directory version. So if you have some old software that is dependent on an older version of Perl, you can say, if I'm running this software, use this version of Perl, otherwise use new and, and shiny stuff. Probrew does have one advantage over PLENV and that website, man, it's a kick-ass mm -hmm. website. Um, so speaking of installing stuff, we also have some tools that make installing and managing modules easier. Uh, primarily one called Locallib. Um, Local lib lets you install your own copies of modules in your home directory. So even if you're using user bin Perl, you can still install a module in your home directory and set Perl up so that it will find it. You can install per project modules. So if you, again, have an older project that depends on a particular version of a particular module, you can set it up so that it always uses that version and it carries that version inside the directory. It integrates well with all the other tools I'm gonna to talk about. Um, and I'm not gonna go into how to make it work. You have to set up a couple of things in your shell so that the, the paths work out right, but it is extremely well documented. Um, this was developed by Matt Trout, so much love to Matt for setting up local lib. Um, speaking of installation tools, this is the best garage sale sign ever. <laughs> um, we have a new CPAN client these days. So CPAN is uh, the the repository of all Perl modules. And the original client that ships with Perl is called CPAN, the, the command line client that you use to install modules. We have a new one these days called CPAN minus, because it does less. That's abbreviated CPAN M, that's the, the binary that you run. So this is the output from the default uh, CPAN client installing a module called git wrapper. And it prints out all this stuff, and then it prints out more stuff. And it actually printed out even more stuff, but I got tired of pasting it into slides. Um, this is what CPAN M prints out. So the minus is just like, it only tells you, hey, it worked or it didn't work. Um, so th that is pretty awesome. If you're not using CPAN minus, you should. Um, we also have another tool called Carton. Carton lets you, or helps <coughs> manage module dependencies in a project. It's particularly useful if you are working in a large project with multiple developers and you need to ensure that everybody has the same version of everything. So this is sort of like uh, package lock in NPM or bundler in Ruby. Um, it's actually explicitly modeled in bundler and that's why it's called Carton. Um, it allows you to freeze your dependencies. So you always install the same versions of everything regardless of what environment you're installing into. Uh, bundler was developed by uh, a person named Miyagawa, uh, or sorry, Carton. And CPEN minus. We're both developed by Miyagawa. Um, so thanks to him for that. There is another tool similarly, uh, kind of somewhat like Carton, um, called Pinto. Pinto lets you operate your own private CPAN within your organization. Um, and it basically serves as a kind of layer on top of the regular CPAN. So you can declare module dependencies, store them in your Pinto. And if, uh, when you're trying to install stuff, if it's not found in your Pinto, it will fall through to the normal CPAN lookup. 
Um, so if you're doing, again, large organizational development where you might have multiple teams shipping things at different times, uh, Pinto provides a, a really nice way to use the normal Perl module tools to install your own uh, self-made modules. It's your very own private CPAN. Uh, and it was developed by Jeff Thalhammer. Thank you, Jeff. So speaking of CPAN, um, we have a whole new website these days for inter interacting with CPAN, and it's metacpan.org. The old website, which you may be familiar with, which is search.cpan.org, is still there, it still works, um, but MetaCPAN integrates and visualizes a whole bunch of more information in a much more useful way. So this is that same module that I was installing before. I like to use this because it's one of mine. Um, this is over here on the left-hand side, just blown up bigger so you can see it. So it displays the source code in both a raw form and a syntax highlighted form, lets you browse through all the files in the package, links to the changelog, the home page, the repository where the code is hosted, the issue tracker, and this is all driven by a configuration file that ships with the library. So different people prefer to use different issue trackers. These, this is tracked on GitHub, but there are some people who still use RT. So MetaCPAN actually reads that information out of a YAML file in the distribution that's shipped and populates all this stuff uh, automatically. Also gives you this nice activity graph where you can tell I haven't really touched this module for a long time because it's stable, which is fine. Um, it's also, uh, MetaCPAN is also all open source. So if you can think of a way to make it better, you can. Uh, it's still a pretty active project. So there, that's pull request 2040. Um, so it's a nice group of people working on it too. Uh, and that's their GitHub. Um, it, it, it's a fairly substantial team at this point, so thanks to them. Uh, we also have a new search engine uh, you may have heard of. Who uses DuckDuckGo? Cool, most of the room. Uh, it's partially written in Perl, which is kind of cool. The thing that I like most about DuckDuckGo uh, is Bang searches. Do people know about Bang searches? So if you go to DuckDuckGo, you can do an exclamation point and then a keyword, and it will do a search with only within a certain site. So uh, Bang GI is Google Images. Uh, Bang IMDB is IMDB. Uh, Bang Flight Aware is the Flight Aware website if you do a lot of flying. And Bang CPAN searches just Meta CPAN. Um, so this is pretty cool. Speaking of modules, um, anybody who's doing web development in Perl these days or, or web development at all needs, like, you're going to have to interact with JSON. I, I hate to break it to you. Um, there is a Perl module that you should be using if you're using JSON in Perl called JSON Maybe XS. And what this does, uh, there are, because Perl is Perl, uh, we have multiple different JSON libraries. JSON Maybe XS makes sure that one of them is installed. And it goes in this order. It uses uh, something called cPanel JSON XS, which is a fork of JSON XS because the guy who maintains it is a jerk. Um, <laughs> it's pretty much the nicest thing I can say about it. Uh, and if you, for some reason, the XS modules require a C compiler to build, if for some reason you don't have a C compiler on your system, it will fall back to something called JSON PP, which stands for pure Perl. So JSON maybe XS goes through these in this version. So this makes it a lot easier to distribute software that consumes or produces JSON because you don't have to worry about forcing someone to install a particular one of these. Um, we also do a lot of object-oriented programming in Perl these days. Um, and the OO that Perl ships with out of the box is uh, minimal um, and, and somewhat confusing. So uh, a group of people made a module called Moose, uh, which is a new OO framework. If you're doing any kind of object-oriented programming in Perl, you should look at Moose. It's one of the nicest uh, object-oriented systems I've seen in any programming language. It's somewhat modeled on CLOS the common Lisp object system. And then once you've sort of observe, uh, learned Moose and how it works, you can throw that away and use something called Moo, which is the three-fifths of Moose that you actually need. Um, that's why it's called yeah. Moo. Um, Moose has a lot of support for metaprogramming that you usually don't need. Um, and so Moo kind of throws away all the metaprogramming stuff and just gives you attributes and methods and class declarations. I do have bad news uh, for people who've been around Perl a long time. We got rid of CGI.pm. Uh, we decided it's a bad idea. Uh, it's, it's not actually gone. You can still install it. It's on CPAN, but we don't ship it as part of the core Perl distribution anymore. 
uh, because nobody really does CGI <laughs> anymore. It's 2018. Um, <laughs> the new uh, pearl hotness for web stuff is called Plaque. Uh, this is also developed by Miyagawa. It's modeled on the uh, system from Ruby called Rack, uh, so the PL for Perl. Um, it offers a number of advantages over CGI, and pretty much all of the modern Perl uh, web frameworks, Catalyst and Dancer and Mojo Lissish, all use Plaque under the hood. Okay, so speaking of websites, That's right. um, Sawyer, a couple of years ago, uh, after about a year of being Pump King, he started doing uh, roughly monthly summaries of the activity on the Perl 5 Porter's mailing list. This is the mailing list where the ongoing active development of Perl is discussed. And it can be high traffic, um, so if you want to sort of keep up with what's going on there but not actually get 20 to 30 emails a day from this list, you can read these mailing list summaries, which he puts up on his blog, blogs.perl.org, users, Sawyer X. Um, so this is a super useful way to keep up with development but not have to go through all that email. Um, we also have a really nice site called cpanratings.perl.org. Um, so one of the great strengths of Perl is CPAN, it's the module site. Most of the time programming stuff in Perl is less about actually writing code and more about finding the three modules that are already out there and sort of tying them together to do what you want, um, which is awesome, but also kind of sucky because there's like 20,000 modules on there and anything, any one thing you look for, there will be three implementations of it. And then you have to decide which one to use. So CPAN ratings helps with that. People write reviews of modules. Um, this is something that I really wish other programming communities would do. Um, I keep threatening to start doing this for NPM um, because it has the same problem, only no actual rating site. Um, the reviews are tied to a particular version of the module. So the one disadvantage of that is something could have originally been crappy and got bad reviews and then got better. So you need to make sure uh, which version of a module is being reviewed. And this is integrated into MetaCPAN. It links to those reviews right there. It gives you the aggregate average, tells you how many reviews there are. So when you're looking for a module uh, to potentially use, this is a good thing to look at. How heavily reviewed is it? What are the ratings? We also have a site called CPANTS. Um, <laughs> CPANTS uh, is at cpants.cpantauthors.org. This is a site that uses uh, automated testing around consensus best practices for Perl software development. So it basically tells you how good the code in a module is. Uh, it uses a, a metric called quality, which is kind of like quality, but not really. Um, and there are just a bunch of different core metrics. This is all generated and analyzed automatically. So you can see that on a per module basis. You can see it on an author basis. So the quality score here. Um, so this is, again, useful when you're trying to determine whose code to use. You can look and see how well do they follow the rules that the community has sort of de decided are the best way to do things. Yes? In your experience, how well does a quality score correspond to it actually doing, or it actually working right and working well? Um, working right is completely orthogonal. <laughs> <laughs> working well is, so some of the things that get, uh, analyzed in this are around um, whether they pop whether the the software out there populated the metadata properly um, it just gives you sort of a measure of the amount of care that is put into the development which is again it, it's it's called quality because it's not really quality it's things that are a, generally a proxy for quality so I don't know if I answered that question or just sort of sidestepped it but <laughs> I think that helps you basically said that tells you how uh, diligent the author has been about following standards. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Was it secretly made by KDE devs? <laughs> no, this predates KDE. <laughs> um, so that's it. You, you can go to cpan, cpan, cpanauthors.org slash author, and then someone's pause ID, which it should say JNAC here. Um, I'm unhappy with my slide software today. <laughs> uh, Meta CPAN links to cpants here with this quality link right there. Um, MetaCPAN also links to this site called CPAN Testers. So you can see this information right here. Um, when you install any Perl module by default using CPAN minus or CPAN, uh, it says right there building and testing. 
right? So one of the best things about Perl is that there is an expectation that if you write code and share it with people, it will come with tests. It will come with a test suite that exercises the code. And when you install it, we actually run that test suite on the machine where you are installing the software. So it not only is tested to work on the author's machine, it's tested to work on the machine where you're going to use it. And you can also install a second little piece of software that then turns around and ships those test results back to a central location, which is cpentesters.org. So this is, again, it's cut off at the top, but this is that same Git wrapper module. Um, these are test results from people who installed the module on SIGWIN, Darwin, FreeBSD, GNU, K, FreeBSD, Linux, MS-132, NetBSD, OpenBSD, and Solaris for Perl versions from 5.27.5 down to like 5.6. Anywhere it's green, the test suite all passed. So you can see here, I had a problem on Win32 with Perl 5.22, it failed about half the time. Anytime one of these fails, I get an email yeah. with the output of the tests. This is, sweet. technically speaking, fucking awesome, right? <laughs> Again, it's just a, a, so steal this. Like if you are from another language community that is not Perl, like figure out how to do this. The key is actually running the tests on the people's machines when you install the software. Please steal this, right? The, the lack of this is the most annoying thing about writing code in other languages because I don't get that feedback loop um, when I screw stuff up, which I want. Um, all right, speaking of community, this is a group of people from a Perl conference two or three conferences ago. This was the night that Brexit passed. We were in Florida, it was about 2 a.m. and we were, the bar had closed, we were getting ready to go to bed and Brexit passed and about half the group was from England and Ireland. Um, so people went back to the rooms and got more booze. Um, <laughs> This is a friend of mine uh, responding to a tweet from Programming Wisdom that says, when you choose a language, you're choosing more than a set of technical trade-offs, you're choosing a community. He says, I may not write Perl for a living anymore, but the community is one of the reasons I still recommend it without reservation. Um, I don't write that much Perl anymore either. Um, I still go to the conferences because of the people. Um, and if, if you like to go to conferences and you are a consumer of adult beverages, mm -hmm. it is been widely related to me on multiple occasions that the Pearl people are the fun ones to hang out with. <laughs> um, so we do have a variety of conferences and workshops and monger groups. Um, so we have one big, the, the big conference is now called uh, The Pearl Conference. It used to be called Yapsi or yet another Pearl mm -hmm. Conference. Um, it's held once a year or so. There's usually one in North America and one in Europe. Uh, this year it's going to be in Salt Lake City in the middle of June. Um, and then there's one, the European one is going to be in Glasgow in August. Uh, sometimes they have one in Asia. They have held them in Brazil and Russia in the past. Uh, we also have workshops, which are smaller, uh, more regional meetings. Um, there was one in Pittsburgh for a number of years. Uh, the Pearl Group in the DC Baltimore area puts one on. Um, and they've been held in Orlando in the past. Um, and then Pearl Mongers groups, Pearl mongers are, or a monger is a person who, who does Pearl. Um, this is a location map of all of the Pearl monger groups that are registered in North America. Um, you can get that at that URL. If you are doing Pearl at all, you should consider becoming more actively involved in the community. Um, and you can probably find a local group. And if you can't, you can start a local group very easily. Um, finally, I want to give a big shout out to this website called uh, pearlweekly.com. This is a weekly email newsletter, also posted on the website, of basically stuff going on in the Perl community and stuff in broader programming communities that might be of interest to Perl programmers. If you're only gonna pay attention to one thing from this talk and it's not CPEN minus, it should be subscribing to Perl Weekly. Um, all right, thank you. Uh, thanks to the organizers for accepting the talk. Thanks to all of you for coming out to the talk here on the, the second and last day. Thanks to my employer for uh, paying to send me to this conference Yay. to give this talk. <laughs> um, if anybody needs custom software development, technology consulting, or training, hit me up. Um, we have a summer internship program. Uh, applications for that close tomorrow. So if you're looking for an internship, you can get information about it at this URL. And then finally, um, 
in my copious free time, I am one of the uh, people on the program committee for a conference called Seagull, which is held in Seattle in October. And our CFP is opening June 4th. So you should consider coming to Seagull. It is free to attend. Um, and it's generally a pretty good conference, I think. And now I am happy to take questions, if anyone should have any. What is Seagull about? Um, it actually, the, excuse me, the GL stands for GNU Linux, um, but we're not really as doctrinaire as that might lead you to believe. Um, it's pretty much just an open source programming conference, community organized, very, uh, very low key. Uh, shut downtown Seattle. Yeah. Something else to Very, very similar feel. Yes, sir. Uh, so if curl pipe and curl sex are considered to be very separate things, uh, what's the future roadmap for continued versions of those? Because they're each kind of running parallel for a while, or is there going to be some sort of a... Uh, so if, if curl five and curl six are considered to be separate things, what, what does the future hold for each of them? That is um, an extremely contentious topic. <laughs> um, and the answer that you get kind of depends on uh, who you ask. Um, I think there are some Perl 6 people who, there are efforts underway to make it possible to run Perl 5 code through the Perl 6 interpreter. Um, and I think the long-term intent there is to try to kind of reunify things. Um, but there is a pretty hardcore Perl 5 people who just aren't interested in Perl 6 at all um, and have no plans to move um, and will probably keep uh, maintaining the language for as long as stuff is is written in it. Um, I don't expect Perl 5 to go away anytime soon. I mean, we still employ COBOL programmers, um, maybe not very many of them. Um, part of the part of the um, part of the the issue in general is Perl because of of when it started, um, because it was the first sort of scripting. I hate that description, but it was the first sort of scripting language happened around the time that the web was getting started, it was the only occupant of that particular niche, right? And so it got really big and popular, and a lot of people who are still in the community came into the community at that point and, and have this internalized image of Perl as the way, right? The, the one thing. And now we have, it turns out, many things have filled that niche, right? You've got, uh, you've got Node, you've got Python, you've got Ruby, you've got... Uh, you know, pick your poison. And regardless of, of how you feel about Perl, the language, right? And people have strong opinions there too, but it's never going to be the one thing anymore. And if you were around when it is the one thing, that's a difficult, that's a bitter pill to swallow, right? <laughs> so there, there are some Perl 5 people who are still, you know, they were the star quarterback in high school and they never quite got over it. Um, so th there's a, a definite threat of that too, and that also impinges on the Perl 5, Perl 6 stuff. So it, it's, it's a complicated, messy thing, but neither one of them is going away. So are, are there any advantages to Perl 6? If you, if I am to... not the right person to ask Perl 6 questions of, because I have done very little with it. Um, it is not... Uh, so I'm, I'm an IT consultant. Um, I do play around with this stuff in my spare time, but even my playing around has to be focused on stuff that I might potentially be able to charge people money for. And Perl 6 is not there yet. So what's the impetus for Perl 6? Why, why it, was a, it was a language redesign. It was the same impetus as going from Perl 4 to Perl 5. Yeah, but, but, but is Larry Wall still involved? Yeah, Larry, Larry is totally not involved with Perl 5 anymore. He is okay. doing Perl 6. Gotcha. Like, have you ever looked back at your own code and gone, oh, if only I could start over, I'd take all of these lessons? Oh, yeah. Like, mm -hmm. sure. It, um, it, yeah, there, at some point, somebody is going to sit down and write a definitive history of the Perl 6 project, and we're going to learn many truths from it, but it, um, at least from the outside, it kind of went through a cycle typical, uh, it, if you've ever heard of the second system syndrome, um, which is the second time you sit down to write something, you say, this time I'm gonna do it right, and it takes three times as long, and it's not as good. <laughs> um, there was a hand in the back. Okay. What's the uh, Perl 5 concurrency story these days? What is the Perl 5 concurrency story these days? Uh, there is a module called CoRo, uh, which stands for coroutines, that is built on top of uh, libEV, 
which is a, a commonly used uh, sort of cooperative multitasking library. Um, a lot of people use that. Um, the person who maintains that is the same jerky person who maintains JSONXS. Um, so I don't recommend it necessarily. Um, you can build Perl with support for operating system level threads uh, if you're running on Linux. Um, that is uh, somewhat supported, but again, not highly recommended. Um, so TLDR, it's not great. Um, it's, it's not really a... Like, if you needed heavy concurrency, you shouldn't pick it up. Um, a lot of Perl people have uh, escaped into the Go community. Um, so probably the, the most uh, Perlish answer would be write it in Go. I mean, the, the other thing, there's a, there's a really old, uh, I think it was Ken Thompson quote, that um, some, is something along the lines of, like, in Unix, you need to remember that thread is spelled F-O-R-K. <laughs> um, and that's the concurrency story is just run more processes. Other questions? All right. Thanks for coming out, everybody. <laughs>